Hey there, cats and kitties. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and with this video, we discuss my thoughts on episode 7 of the anime series Violet Evergarden. <laughs> This episode was kind of an emotional roller coaster for me. Um, definitely something strange and almost schizophrenic as far as the emotions goes. You know, it opens with this grand dramatic scene on stage. You know, I was immediately thinking of something like Shakespeare. And uh, I didn't want to have those lofty impressions going into this because I was still sort of smarting over the last episode, which completely sidelined from where we had left off the episode prior to that. And you know, there's this grand sense of so much time having passed that Violet's been doing this for years. She's been traveling for years. I did not expect to open this episode and suddenly be reintroduced to all of her auto memoir doll, you know, compadres and co-workers and everything as we were. And she's given this mission to essentially, you know, travel out to a cabin in the woods. Um, you know, this lakeside cabin where there is this playwright who is beside himself with grief. He, he's become a drunkard because of that grief. And uh, I'm just thinking in the early going of this episode, they're already ramping up the melodrama, the lack of tension, the sort of cliche aspect to this potential story. I didn't know exactly how it was going to go. And, and I'm just reflecting back in the early going of this episode of my formative years in the 90s uh where late night you know i turn on skinamax and 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 this is basically the plot line of so many of those movies you know something similar to this um and i'm just like okay how how disastrous is this gonna get <laughs> You know, um, but I was actually somewhat delighted in the fact that it actually had a really heartening, emotional, dramatic story. I could highly identify with the writer, with the exception of the, you know, drinking alcohol and everything like that, which I, I don't do. Um, you know, having everything that I love under God, taken by God and all that kind of stuff, losing my parents and grandparents and everything early in life, uh, my aspirations to be a writer, not necessarily a playwright, but all that kind of stuff. You know, I could highly identify to those aspects of, of what he what he had lost and how he was so emotionally impacted and, and just driven into a hole, you know. He had closed himself off, sort of cast himself in a pseudo-exile because he just, he'd lost so much in his life, his wife, then his daughter, and uh, they they could have probably explained a little better how exactly his daughter, you know, her life had ended. Uh, obviously, she had, you know, contracted some kind of disease, and we find out that the, the mother, his wife, had passed away, succumbing to a disease very similarly, and, you know, they could have probably been a little, add a little more detail into how that exactly played out. Um... And then to call back on the first impressions I had with Shakespeare, there's been a long-standing debate for many decades, uh, many centuries, really, <laughs> you know, about um, the impact on Shakespeare's life that the loss of one of his sons at the age of 11, 11 Hamnet, uh, had on his life and whether or not that impacted his, you know, playwriting and everything like that, because there would be, you know, he had been writing comedies early in his career and after the death of this son, and other subsequent things that happened in his life, he would go on to write tragedies. And, you know, it's been a long-standing scholarly debate. Had that had an impact on his life, was his sudden turn in mood in, in the kinds of, you know, plays he was writing, was that impacted or influenced anyway by the death of his son? And it's, it's largely debatable, but I, I was really thinking of that with this promise left thus far unanswered until Violet becomes involved that this playwright had for completing the story, a story he would, you know, whimsically tell his daughter about this little girl, Olive, and, and her travels traversing this fantasy world where she was trying to get back to her father and all that kind of stuff. And it just really tugged at my heartstrings how involved Violet was getting to the story. Like, she was really wrapped up into it and everything. And, and this made the writer, you know, that much more satisfied with his work because that's sort of his target audience. He wants to write this play for a younger audience where I guess the rest of his works, you know, ha has been more adult-oriented. And just her involvement in that, her infatuation with it as she's writing it and, and she's begging of him, you know, is she going to get home? What's going to happen? Please finish this. And even amidst the conflict of his recollecting back and being reminded of the loss of, of his child, being reminded of his daughter through Violet's behavior and, and looks and everything like that, um, it definitely 
surprised me just how like attached to this whole dynamic I, I was drawn into it you know how, how attached I'd become with it um, much as Violet herself would be attached to the story and I love like that whole sequence where she tries to answer to the promise his daughter made in, in answer to his trying to fulfill the promise he made to his daughter where he's like, you know, Violet, act this out for me. Um, if you would take the parasol, go around the lakeside and try to cross the lake, step on the leaves if you can. And because Violet is who she is, she takes it literally and she's like, OK, I'll try. <laughs> you know. And she goes and, and there he is, like watching awestruck, I, I would assume worried as well, <laughs> you know, because I had assumed she would take a running jump right into the water, you know. And the way the way they they edit and direct the entirety of the scene, she takes that running leap and she I guess she kind of skips along the water a little bit. Um, arguably, we don't really see it in its entirety, but the way they sort of wrap around her at that one point in slow motion and you see her in the air and, you know, this playwright is observing this completely, you know, his mind is blown and everything and, and getting caught up in the emotions of that moment realizing that in essence Violet has answered to the promise his daughter once made him that she would make that leap across the lake and thus you know em embedding in him this idea that okay I have to if I don't do anything else in my life if I don't complete anything else I have to complete that promise to my daughter to finish this story for her you know in, in her memory and it it was just I didn't get misty eyed, but I felt the impact of the that whole emotional moment, you know, the torrent of that moment. And I was thinking, you know, this has been a pretty good episode, um, especially considering like the last one that just uh, I wasn't that thrilled with. I didn't like the melodrama of the characters, a lot of the cliche stuff that was going on in it, as I spoke about in my previous episode discussion video. And um, this one completely surpassed it. I, I almost found myself thinking, you know, the entire structure of the series is still, I, I still believe it's heavily wonky. Um, because I think a large portion of what happened in this episode could have happened before the previous. And a lot of what happened in the previous episode, you know, it, it, that could have been saved for last. That could have been like the last episode of the series where Violet has finally come to terms with, you know, the loss of Gilbert, the major and everything like that. Um, and she's, she's finally found some self-worth and some self-satisfaction of traveling the world and experiencing life, the, the kind of life Gilbert, Gilbert had wanted for her. Um, and, and, you know, like that, that's the impression I have of it. A lot of this is poorly structured and, and it felt like, again, a large chunk of this episode should have happened, should have come before the previous. Um, but then as we transition, I was surprised at how <laughs> early into the episode, the story was for all intents and purposes wrapped up. And then we follow Violet going back home via, you know, sailing vessel once again, and, and all of the emotions and calling back on what she has been told time and again, you know, the reprimands that she's gotten for the lives she's taken. And don't, aren't you affected by that? Don't you have any emotional impact that you've experienced because of that? Look at all the lives you've extinguished and, and you don't feel guilt. You don't feel remorse. You're not even aware of that. You're not impacted by that. You're on fire. And, and one day when, when you can get in touch with those emotions and equate what that feels like, you're, you're going to explode. And, she she basically has that meltdown and i was suddenly just drawn to her <laughs> you know like i was just like oh man my my breath was caught in my throat i couldn't believe what what i was seeing essentially and she kind of comes to terms with it enough to kind of sort of go back to status quo uh for all but a moment <laughs> because as soon, as soon as she gets off that vessel there is the elderly Mrs. Evergarden, and she just happens to let it slip. Oh, the late Gilbert. The late Gilbert would be happy that you've grown up. And I felt like I got smacked upside the head by a two by four, let alone what Violet must have gone through in that moment. I was literally like, oh, shit. <laughs> Pardon my French. I'm just like, whoa. She just, she just told her. <laughs> 
know. And of course, she runs right back to her boss and starts scrutinizing him and getting up in his face. You told me he was alive. He's still out there somewhere. Oh, well, you know, he had pushed you out of the building before it got blasted by bombs and, and there was no body ever found. But, you know, we found his like dog tags and and, and she's in denial about it. She's like, oh, well, then that means he, he must still be out there somewhere. There's somewhere out there in the world that he is. And again, that's why I feel like the the previous episode, so much of that could have been the finale of this series where she's still traveling because some part of that traveling is seeking Gilbert out there somewhere, seeking the major somewhere out there in the world, you know, holding on to that belief, but not letting it, you know, sort of make her stagnate and, and, and crawl back into her own shell like the playwright in this episode had done until being influenced and impacted by Violet and, and her personality and answering to the wishes and hopes and dreams he held, he had once held, for his daughter and the promise he made to her. I mean, you know, Violet could very much have, have retracted herself and enclosed herself away from the world. And so it would have made sense to see so many years having gone by and her still traveling and still trying to find, you know, holding on to that hope that out there somewhere, eventually she might one day run into Gilbert again. Um... And it's just, it was the the impact of this, this revelation finally, which has been long speculated by myself and I'm sure many others watching the show, not familiar with the source material, that Gilbert is probably well and truly dead. And finally, just they layeth the smacketh down right across her chops, right across my chops as a viewer. I didn't see it coming. Um, and whereas I felt so much of this episode, everything dealing with the playwright and the memories of his daughter could have come before the previous episode, all of that stuff that followed on where Violet was finally left to confront those emotions, that torrent going on inside her as she became aware of what extinguishing those lives actually amounted to for herself, you know, all of that stuff could have been almost endgame as well, uh, just precursor to her finally you know, reaching some level of semblance in her life and deciding to continue traveling and continue writing letters and, and seeking some estimation of the major, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I do, I, I do still stand by my appraisal that this, this series is all over the place. It's schizophrenic at best as far as how they're doling out this story and flip-flopping back and forth between senses of, of you know, time, the, the time that has you know, sort of gone by, um, again, the previous episode via her own dialogue. Violet says she's been doing this for years, and, and suddenly it feels like we're back to an earlier part at the start of this episode where she's still amongst her, her, you know, co-workers with the Auto Memoir doll HQ that she, the one she sidled up with, and, uh, everything that came toward the end of the episode felt like, you know, we'd finally gotten toward the end of the series, <laughs> so it does feel emotionally and, and plot-wise all over the place as a series. Uh, but I, I also stand by my appraisal of it that when they get it right, when they really touch upon the emotional impact, the core of the characterization and the drama, holy hell, man, it's, it's palpable. The tension is palpable. You can cut it like butter. Um, and <laughs> it's just the weight of that, the weight of being suddenly confronted with Gilbert is no more in such an aloof off the cuff indirect manner but the impact was solidified you know it, it was thorough it, it was deep and engaging and, and engrossing and heartbreaking and uh i can only hope <laughs> as we get into the next episode i can only hope with all desperate want and need and desire that we don't suddenly just start a brand new story out of nowhere with nothing you know falling on from this as we did a couple episodes ago, they better damn well continue from where this one leaves off. And we better have it pointedly centered around Violet because of what she's going through and what she just had, you know, dropped in her lap, essentially. Um, it is momentous, monumentous. It, it's nth degree. And we need we need to continue on with this and see her dealing with it, and how she deals with it, and, and such like that, and what decisions she makes, how this influences where she will go, whatever her directive will become in the aftermath. 
And so I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below what you thought of episode 7 of Violet Evergarden, if you've seen it as well, if you were as emotionally impacted as I was, pleasantly surprised as I was, that there was actually a coherent sort of plot line going on in this episode from beat to beat to beat. And, uh, you know, love it or hate it, anything goes in the comments below. If you're still having trouble with the wonkiness of, of the plotting and the direction of this series, you know, it is still a problem. Um, but at least this episode made up for it in you know, the revelations and the evolution of Violet as a character, I felt anyway. And uh, so, yeah, otherwise, it'll be pretty much it for me on this one. This video finds you well, and I'll catch you all later. Peace.